Hello, and welcome to the Beam PPRA Bar Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. Every week, Talking Heads will bring you in depth insights and analysis through the lens of sustainability on the topics that really matter to investors. In this episode, we'll be discussing sustainable investing in infrastructure debt. I'm Daniel Morris, Chief Market Strategist, and I'm joined by Investment Director for Infrastructure Debt, Stephanie Passé, and ESG Specialist and Lead on Private Assets, Maxence Foucault. Welcome to the both of you, and thanks for joining me. Thank you, Daniel. Nice to be here. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Stephanie. Very glad to be with you today. We're all aware of the challenges of investing with rising interest rates. And now you have the additional challenge of trying to achieve sustainability objectives. How then exactly do you combine sustainability objectives with attractive risk returns for investors? Daniel, that's a really good question. But uh, maybe before answering uh, the questions, probably was providing a few words on the infrastructure asset class that uh, we are targeting today. As you know, infrastructure debt by its nature is financing essential services such as energy, transportation, water distribution. So this asset class has proven to be resilient throughout the economic cycles. And uh, this is again the case in the current rising inflation environment. As most infrastructure revenues are inflation linked or allow for price increase to be passed to the end consumers. What we observe as far as returns are concerned is that our infrastructure debt strategy is mostly a floating rate and as such benefit from the increase in base rates. Uh, We have observed no significant pickup at this stage, especially for core and green assets in terms of spread. So in order to find attractive risk return on green sustainable assets, you therefore need to find less obvious assets that need to be assessed carefully from a sustainability angle. And for this, we rely on uh, the strong expertise uh, of our sustainability center, as uh, Maxence can explain in more detail. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. I fully concur with what you just explained. In the current context where sustainability is becoming more and more central in allocation strategies, there's a growing appetite for assets that are easily identifiable as green. And the typical example for this is, uh, for example, solar plants or wind farms. But what we can say is that there are, however, assets which may be a bit less obvious for traditional investors, um, either because they require a stronger expertise, like projects that are transitioning. uh, And I'm thinking of utilities which are in the process of lowering their emissions or solutions that are relatively new, like hydrogen, gigafactories, energy storage, biogas or even carbon capture, for instance. But I think that in this uh, particular context, origination capabilities are a key element. But maybe, Stephanie, you can give us some more information about that. Hi, Maxon. So you're right. Each member of the infrastructure debt team has developed uh, its own network of partners with syndication desk, advisor, or equity sponsor. For the climate impact strategy, we have a specific partnership with BNP Commercial and Investment Bank, and especially with the Low Carbon Transition Group that is well-placed to identify low-carbon loans that we could invest in as part of the climate impact strategy. But beyond sourcing, expertise in sustainability is absolutely key, and uh, Maxence can uh, detail further. There are frameworks that will enable in the future more harmonization in the way things are done, and I have in mind, for instance, the EU taxonomy. So it is this very ambitious framework by the European Commission with the purpose of driving the economy towards green solutions. But what we can say is that it's only at the beginning and that market players are only slowly starting to align with its requirements. So what we see is that EU taxonomy is more and more assessed in due diligences, but alignment is uh, the exception rather than the rule. And ESG data still need to be harmonized. And and in this particular context, uh, this is why we need strong uh, internal sustainability expertise. So um, we have defined a proprietary approach for our strategies uh, to contribute to mitigating climate change. And this is based on two main gateways, the EU taxonomy and also the UN SDGs, uh, which are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I think we're all aware of the changes that have occurred recently around ESG investing. 
We've had accusations of greenwashing and probably a healthy development in the industry as standards are raised uh, and asset managers in particular uh, are held to account. Stephanie, Maxence, in the current evolving regulatory context, we have seen asset managers challenged, in particular regarding the definition of sustainable investment and reporting requirements. How have you addressed this? Yeah, Daniel, you're right. It's true, it's challenging to structure a long-term sustainable product in a constantly changing regulatory environment. Uh, we have seen the Regulation for Sustainable Financial Disclosure Requirement, SFDR, EU taxonomy. This is why we work closely with the Sustainability Center and our legal team, and that we have regular dialogue with the regulators. Maxence, we have been monitoring those changes for a long time now. Yes, absolutely. So we already had strong experience in integrating ESG before the regulation arrived. And I can give a quick description of what we did. We have different layers of assessment. The first layer is the fact that we make sure that every investment opportunity is aligned with our responsible business conduct policy. And that uh, implies that these uh, investment opportunities must not be in violation with international norms like the UN Global Compact or the OECD guidelines, but also that they don't expose us to controversial activities or, or uh, sensitive activities. Um, the second layer is that we do a transversal ESG assessment. It means that we go beyond climate and we look at things like uh, biodiversity or impact on local communities. And once this is done, we have another layer of assessment, and we do that with the help of an independent expert who calculates certain metrics and does some assessments and includes, for example, uh, induced emissions, avoided emissions, alignment to temperature scenario, and an environmental score. So we did all that before SFDR arrived. So when the regulation uh, arrived, we already had the fundamental bricks that enabled us to build a sound approach with binding criteria in line with sustainable investment requirements. Yes, and, and just to mention that in terms of uh, reporting, we already produce annual ESG report on all our legacy funds uh, in the Infradet team with a qualitative and quantitative analysis on each of our investments. But what we now observe is a higher expectation from investors to have access to reliable data regarding sustainability that they can use for their own reports uh, in order to fulfill SFDR requirements. It is important that the data are produced under a specific standardized format as well. Um, and what is mostly used, uh, we see the European uh, ESG template known as a uh, WT. So we'll uh, align uh, to, to this requirement as well. Absolutely. So we had a solid base in terms of reporting and what we're trying to do is going a step further. Um, and we, we aim at reporting on the principal adverse impacts uh, required by the regulation, which implies getting the data from borrowers or providers. And along with this, we'll also produce an impact report, which will disclose information uh, per asset and the impact generated by the portfolio You've talked about the challenges that you face, but also how you address those challenges. Uh, if we look to the future, is there still scope for innovation in the context of ESG integration? Absolutely. And so what we're doing for this strategy is try and go beyond ESG and integrate the impact dimension. Infrastructure is an asset class with a strong potential for impact. And before maybe replying to your question, I'd like to stress the fact that infrastructure will be fundamental to enable the transition to a low carbon economy. Why? Uh, because it's on the basic services provided by these projects or assets that the economy can function. And so in order for economic players to achieve their emissions commitments, they will need to rely on efficient infrastructure like clean energy production, charging stations, energy storage solutions, and so on. So. These assets are usually considered as alternative, but they're actually very central to climate considerations. Um, so to give you some more context around impact, BNP Paribas Asset Management is a founding signatory of the OPIM, which stands for the Operating Principles for Impact Management. And this is an impact framework that has been launched by the IFC, which is a norm of the World Bank. 
And what they did is that they listed nine principles that defined what is an impact investment. And we really wanted to design this as an impact strategy, which seeks to be aligned with the OPIM. But in terms of innovation, maybe, Stephanie, you would have uh, some insights on potential developments for the future in terms of trends and solutions. Yes, it's true that uh, infrastructure is an uh, evolving uh, asset class, for example, in terms of sectors uh, that we see uh, emerging. We have new sectors in, in the scope of decarbonization, such as uh, giga factories, green hydrogen that uh, we mentioned before, and carbon capture, for example. Uh, we see also uh, interesting discussion on projects that are not yet decarbonized, as well as a discussion on uh, natural capital, for example, forestry. We foresee uh, as well more developments related to the S of uh, ESG, especially when uh, the social uh, EU taxonomy is available. So a lot of new prospects and uh, a lot more to come uh, on the infra side and the climate impact strategy. Thanks very much, Stephanie and Maxence. If I can summarize some of the key points just as an asset class, you highlight that infrastructure debt provides an inflation hedge, partly because the debt is linked to floating rates. And so uh, the value adjusts as interest rates rise. Though we're focusing here much more on sustainability, and you highlighted how infrastructure debt or infrastructure investing will be fundamental to achieving a low carbon economy. Now, investors are increasingly interested in easily identifiable green assets, but infrastructure offers many opportunities for sustainable investing. You acknowledge, however, that long-term sustainable investing is a challenge, but you have a rigorous process and criteria to ensure that you are aligned with the different standards. And ultimately, if we think of the future, you want to go beyond ESG and be able to evaluate the impact of the investments uh, on society and the environment at large. Well, Stephanie and Maxence, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. It was a pleasure to be here today. That's it for this week's episode of Talking Heads. If you would like more information, please reach out to your BNP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out Viewpoint, our website for investment insights at viewpoint.bnpparibas-am.com. Viewpoint brings commentary and analysis in a variety of formats, from investment outlooks to asset allocation videos and podcasts to help investors make better informed decisions. You've been listening to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast with me, Daniel Morris, Stephanie Passe, and Maxence Foucault. Please do join me next week. Until then, take care. This podcast presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BNP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.